Hi everybody, Bob Olson here with Afterlife TV. This is where we search for evidence of life after death and ask the meaningful questions around that subject. Welcome back to Season 2. This is our first episode of Season 2. I'm really excited about it. I hope you are as well. I wanted this session to be very, uh, just really special. I wanted it to be really special. And so it's really hard, you know, who do you choose as a guest uh, on your first episode into the new season? Well, I think we got a really special one here. And uh, his name is Graham Nichols. And he has written a book called Navigating the Outer Body Experience. I have it here. I'll show it to you a couple times as we do this. Uh, there it is there. Great book. Um, Graham sent this to me and, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what to expect. I got into it. just couldn't stop. It's one of those page turners. You don't want to put it down. I really loved it. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk about out-of-body experiences, something we actually, you know, there's a lot of people who have had near-death experiences who have left their body. We haven't talked with anybody who has just um, been an expert on this subject of out-of-body experiences. So here we are. Welcome, Graham Nichols. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. It's really good to talk to you. Now, I've watched a few interviews with you on your website, GrahamNichols.com. There's two L's on the end of Nichols. I... Uh, the one thing that I have noticed and, you know, other other people have suggested as well uh, is that you're just very calm and relaxed and grounding and you make me feel really calm and relaxed and grounding. We'll just, we'll let the uh, audience know my internet was down. For, uh, <laughs> all morning, my internet was down. I called Graham to let him know. I called him on my, uh, on my cell phone. And he just, you know, he was, he laughed. He had, you know, he was like, that happens. Yeah. You know, easy going, relaxed guy and made me calm about it. And then sure enough, a few minutes after we hung up, the internet pops back up. So here we are doing the interviews. Um, I think this is something that, you know, a lot of people are aware of out of body experiences. Few people have ever really thought about it in terms of the way that you teach it, which is, you know, one, it's a spiritual experience. Two, it's an experience that teaches us about so much about about life and death, which we're going to get to in a moment, um, and the oneness of everything. Why don't you just, for those people who really don't fully understand what it is, maybe you could give us a definition of what an out-of-body experience is. Okay. Well, an out-of-body experience, I suppose, the... The clearest definition I can give is it's a complete multi-sensory experience of being, of feeling yourself outside of the body, at another, usually at another location. Often the classic um, experience will be coming out of your body and looking down at yourself from above, almost like a spirit or a, a ghost form, something like that. Very much like what you hear in near-death experience accounts, but it happens when you're completely healthy and everything is normal in your life but just at some um, unusual occurrence that you'll have this experience of uh, being out of the body. Um, often they happen spontaneously but many people develop the skills to do it as well so there's, there's, uh, there's lots of different variations in how the experience can happen but usually they're the common ones being out of the body looking at yourself maybe moving around familiar environment, things like that. Um, sometimes to a, to a very far off uh, location as well, but they're, they're, they're rarer in the, in the early stages of the experience. But as people get more comfortable with having out-of-body experiences, then sometimes they travel a lot further, even out of the planet and to other levels. A lot of people often might call it astral projection. Is there a difference between astral projection and out of body experience? And and if not, what term? Why do you obviously prefer the out of body experience phrase? Um, I think the difference really is the astral projection term generally refers to more the esoteric traditions and the the historical approaches to to out of body experiences, going back to theosophy and the occult traditions and different areas like that and 
I think with my approach I really wanted to bring as much of the science into what I was doing as I could and really try to strip away the belief systems and see what the underlying um, essence of the experience was, try to get to the truth essentially of what might really be going on. In, in the early days when I was learning about the experience I did often look into esoteric writings and there's some really interesting and useful insights in those traditions but at the same time they can also give you ideas that maybe aren't so helpful and they can be limiting ideas so I wanted to try and find what what might be the, the real essence, the true stuff as opposed to the, the stuff that maybe is more just another belief system like there's so many out there so I, I think that's why I lean towards out-of-body experience because it's just descriptive of of what it's like what, of, of what happens rather than um, suggesting something else I mean astral projection um, suggests astral meaning like a star and projection this sense of it, that was actually not a good thing for me as well when I was learning because this idea of projection gave me this sense that it was all about like focusing and forcing it to happen almost you had to project this this thing out um, when in a way I think it's almost the opposite it's almost like letting go to the experience so so yeah the, in, in a way I, I felt the, the the term wasn't wasn't so helpful so I, I went more for IBE and and you did mention, you know, you are sort of, uh, you, well, you're, you're, you have a foundation in the scientific as well. I mean, you, you have a, a fascination with it, obviously, and, and, and you cover a lot of that, you know, in your book. You cover a lot of the questions that people have about science and, and even skepticism, all that stuff. Um, you, and you do cover, and you cover a lot of that information, first of all, in the book, in other interviews that you've done, so I'm not going to get into it too much. I think um, as much as our audience loves the scientific as well, there's some things which are more, you know, what is this experience like? What does it feel like? What does it, you know, look like and, and smell like or whatever um, that I didn't see in, in some of the other interviews, so I want to go in that direction. But... The other, the other two terms that maybe people get confused with a little bit are, you know, near-death experiences and remote viewing. Um, two very different things, but could you sort of tell us how out -of -body experience, the out-of-body experience is related to near-death experiences and remote viewing? Okay, well, I, I, think, um, I think remote viewing is more of an out-of-body perception, maybe, is, an, is another way of putting it where um, instead of the full experience of being separate to the body it's just the perceptual part of, of, uh, of the experience so you might have sensory awareness you might have visuals you might even have other other senses but you're you're always aware of the body at the same time so it's it's kind of more of a information coming in it's more of a, a receiving rather than a experience of going out to or or being externalized in some way, so mm. I think that's how I would describe the difference. And, but I, th I think um, with all these things, they they go along a line in a way. The the remote viewing is 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 one level, and I think even within the out of body experience, there's different levels and different degrees to which the experience can be fully um, multi sensory. Sometimes it can be. Um, a mixture of impressions for example you might have very strong visual impressions but not much of the other senses or sometimes you might just hear and not really have much in the way of visual so it, it can be different to, in the degree to how how you encounter uh, the journey that you go on in any particular experience I, I think with near-death experiences it's it, in a way it's the top of that spectrum of experiences that we're aware of. It's where um, that all of those sensory components, or as far as what I've seen from, from what I've read, I've never had a near-death experience, but from what I've read and uh, people I've talked to, it, it's more of this all-encompassing experience where um, because the body is disconnected essentially, um, or non-active some, to some degree, um, then it allows for the full 
externalization of uh, consciousness or spirit or whatever it is that that is uh, undergoing that experience so I, I think that would really be the difference I think it's uh, it's it's a matter of degree really they're, they're along a they're along a spectrum a, a line of different levels now and and how similar would you say the out of body experience is to the to the near death experience, uh, or what are the differences? Um, I think they can be extremely similar. I think um, often what people describe in the near death experience sounds exactly like things that I've experienced. For example, coming out of the body, seeing myself, and then moving off towards a light, um, which feels like. Um, boundless compassion, um, love energy in a sense, it's very hard to put it into words, but I, I've experienced something very similar to, to the accounts that I've heard like that. Um, also this idea of interconnection in that experience, this sense of um, minds all being connected and one. So I, I think uh, that's all very similar and also the the way of looking down at yourself and seeing the whole scene often accurately uh, to how it is in, in the real world. So I think in a way um, a near-death experience is activated through the body trauma if you like but an out-of-body experience is essentially the same experience but just not initiated through that kind of trauma. It's something that in a way it's often best initiated through a highly healthy situation. So it's almost like they're two ends of the spectrum in, in yeah. terms of your physicality. So uh, one happens when you're almost at the brink of death and the other happens almost when you're in a heightened, um, highly energized state. That, that's what really excited me about this whole idea. You know, I, you know I've, I've talked with a lot of different people. We've, I've interviewed a bunch of people who, um, who have had near-death experiences. And, and, you know, a lot of people I know are like, that would be really cool, except for the near-death part, you know. <laughs> like, to have that experience seems very life-changing. And, I, you know, I always thought, yeah, but, you know, not a, not, the cost is not worth the risk. And, 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 or whatever, the risk is not worth the cost. I don't know. Um, but... The you know obviously that's not even something that you can plan for and uh, you can't create you can't induce on your own uh, and and know that you're gonna live uh, you know and so all of a sudden your book comes and I start you know doing some research on you and I'm like well this this is it this is what people want this <laughs> this is the near death experience without the death part and and, and how fascinating and it really is, uh, and we're going to learn more as as we go along. I'm so excited about this, as you may as you may be able to tell. Uh, let me just start off with you know we have just under thirty thousand uh, Facebook fans, and I and 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 we got a lot of Twitter fans, and we've a I've asked people about you know if they've had out of body experiences and that sort of thing, and a lot of them have. Um, it it seems as though you know, the majority only seem to have one maybe in their lifetime or maybe one or two, and, and that might be about it. Uh, is that common? Is that sort of what happens? Is uh, People who have had them, it sort of just happens very accidentally and it's very brief. What's your, your research on that? O often, yeah, often um, people will just have the one spontaneously. Um, if they, if those people then pursue the area and, and try to learn more about it and try to induce them they've probably got a uh, higher chance than the average person of uh, having more experiences but most people just don't go down that avenue um, but yeah the, the, the average is to have one maybe maybe two or three experiences maximum um, in a spontaneous way um, but then there are the people who, who research the area and start to have them in a more a more consistent way, but I think often that that requires a certain degree of changing your life to some to some level in order to um, facilitate that, in order to create the circumstances for that to happen consistently. 
Right, exactly, and obviously something you've you've done yourself and started at a very young age, which we'll get to in in a bit. But so I have a friend. I was talking to a friend recently, two friends, and they both had uh, a very brief experience, and 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 they were both very similar. So what happened was, just as you've described in the book, it was not in the sleeping state. It was more in the very relaxed, maybe starting to fall asleep state that. All of a sudden, this one girl started feeling that she was leaving her body. She she start she felt as though she was starting to go above her body, and then fear immediately brought brought her back, brought herself back. Boom! That was it. That was her experience. Very brief, but she gets a sense of what that's like. Um, interested. Is fear usually the thing that brings people back? That stops people from having a longer experience. Oh sure, yeah. It's um, unfortunately, it's um, it's it's a real uh, thing that has to be overcome. I think uh, to really move forward with the experiences, it was definitely something that was that was hard for me, just as much as uh, the people I work with. And you know, it, it's it's very common as a as a problem. Um, it's uh, it's it's kind of natural in a way, though. So it's it's very it's very hard to completely get rid of that initially it, the only way you can overcome the fears is really to just become more comfortable with the idea to become uh, more experienced with, with being in that kind of state or at least imagining being in that state almost like when people describe doing something that they find frightening I don't know like public speaking or something like that that's true if they, if they rehearse it in their mind um, often that can just help to make them more comfortable with the idea. I think OBEs can be similar if you start to be more comfortable with it by imagining going through the process, um, reading other people's accounts and, and just getting to know that the experiences are generally very positive and not not fearful in any way. Um, I haven't really come across anyone who's had uh, negative uh, out-of-body experiences, only maybe their interpretation if they if they felt scared because they thought they were dying or something like that. So. that that's right. And in all, in so many spiritual experiences, it's the interpreta- our interpretation of it that often um, will make it a scary thing, where someone else could have the exact same experience and, and, and because of their beliefs might be a little bit different, they tend to just not be scared by it. it, it, it they see it with a different paradigm. Um, it's interesting that you brought up the public speaking thing because I was thinking, you know, in one way, people hearing your story and, and, and listening to you, they can, it will help them overcome their fears, and I'm sure it will. But is it really more just doing it that, that really helps people overcome it? Is that really kind of what is necessary? Um, yeah, I, I, think, I think you can definitely diminish the fears by different techniques like... like uh, visualization and whatever, but I think yeah, ultimately, um, getting comfortable with with the different states that you'll come into, like the vibrational state, for example. Some people find it frightening at first. Some people find it um, exciting. You know, it, it can be very different interpretations to it. But that's often the first sign that people will undergo that gives them this sense that oh there's an out of body experience coming or it might be about to happen um, and, and often that's when they become oh my god you know this is <laughs> this is actually going to happen um, yeah yeah so, so it, and, it, and it's at that point in a way that they need to be most uh, relaxed and go with the process as much as possible and, and not be focusing on on the physical body as well um, even even though all this activity is happening around their body, so it's a bit of a, a trick there to try and uh, be aware of something else while while your body is uh, surrounded by energy and vibration. So yeah, yeah, and 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 just so other people know, um, without having you tell the story, I'm going to give a, give a little away because I, I, you've you've talked about it in other interviews. Is this idea, um, like you said, you had you had your own fears and. And and some of that meant, you know, once you started, once you were less fearful about leaving your body, you didn't want to leave 
your bedroom. And then once you got beyond that, you went, you know, into your home. But I'm sure then there was a certain fear about leaving the home, right? So there's just these different stages that even you went through before you were ready to, you know, really take some long journeys. Is that correct? Or did I paraphrase that correctly? Yeah, totally. Yeah, it, it was a it was a long a long process, really. I mean, although I had had some spontaneous experiences when I was young, I, I wasn't really a, a natural in, in a sense. It, it took a lot of work and effort for me to learn to do it in a consistent way. So, um, and I, I think the thing I, when I couldn't really get out of my bedroom or out of my my home initially, I, d I didn't associate it at the time with fear. I, in, a, in a way, I just accepted that maybe that was the, the limits of the experience at the time. But now looking back, I, I would gen generally say, yes, I think that was a, a fear-related response. I'm, I much more now see these experiences that they are coloured by the consciousness that, that we're operating through and the fears, the beliefs, all of those things. Um, if we think about it in terms of it is a consciousness extended beyond the body, then really all of those things that are within our consciousness, within our minds, um, would become a part of the framework of how we experience mm, things. Mm. Uh, that seems to make total sense to me. Um, yeah. and, and that seems backed up by what happens when I when I had these experiences earlier on, and also now they're much more. Um, I just kind of phase in and out. I don't even really have very much the the sense of leaving the body. It's more I go into this uh, almost uh, blackout phase, and then I'll find myself at another location. And it's interesting. More and more of my students I'm finding are having a similar experience where they'll go into this blackout phase and then they'll find themselves at another location so they're not they're not even having this sense of exiting the body so much that's uh, that happens with some people but not others so is that so, so that's more of a, a beginner's kind of experience where you feel yourself leave the body and, and and see your body and that sort of thing that's is that more of an early stage OBE um, I'm not sure I'd say that because sometimes I do still experience a body and, and I do experience the exiting. I think it's more that it's uh, maybe the, the level or the frequency that you're operating on um, and that can happen at any stage in your development but probably does happen more in the, in the early stages because we're more, we identify more with our bodies early on I think and, and as we develop we have that sense of self or identity located in the body less and less as we go through the process of our connecting with those higher levels or those spiritual levels. Yeah. It seems, yeah. It seems less us in a way. We, we don't think, oh, I am my body anymore. We, we think of ourselves as more than that. It's interesting. I mean, so much of this, things that you're talking about, just remind me, it's sort of a metaphor for life. It just seems metaphors for life. Like even the idea of, you know, I didn't leave my room because I just never really thought about it and that idea, you know. Uh, I remember one time I was stuck on a roof. I was working up on a roof and my ladder fell down and I stayed up on the roof for hours and I, there, was a, there was a ladder on the back that some other guy had left on the back. I didn't even look because it didn't even cross my mind that there might be a ladder somewhere else on the roof, you know. So I waited for hours for someone to come home to rescue me, you know. Just that idea of so much of life is like that, you know. We don't move beyond our limits because we don't think to. We don't. We, we make huge assumptions about <laughs> how the world actually operates. And yeah. Works. And once we start to let go of those, suddenly all these new avenues, doors open up to us. So yeah, I think I think it it is a great metaphor for life. It really is, and that's and that's why this work that you're doing is so important because you're teaching people what is possible with the out of body experience. You know, so you're sort of. I mean, really, I know there's been others, but even the books that you were reading early on when you were 12 years old, um, I mean, they were really limited. They were really basic, vague kind of things. And, and, 
And you have described it in such a way that, you know, people can really understand the out-of-body experience and then they can work with you to help understand it as well. I think that's, it's just a new frontier that people, you know, you're, you're allowing people to do something um, that, like, we didn't even really realize we could do before. So I, li- I, really, I really like that about the work that you're doing. Um, I would love for you to share some of your experiences. So on this line, maybe you could give us a sense, what is this like? So I have some things that I know that you've talked about or written about in the, in the, in the past um, where you have left your body and experienced these different things. Let's, um, I heard you talk about as you're sort of out of your body, traveling through town or whatever, traveling across the lands, you recognize that that like buildings had frequencies. So tell us a little bit about that. I think that's fascinating. I think it is one of the most fascinating things actually, because I think it gives a, an extra insight into how our reality works in a way. Um, but yeah, sometimes when I have an out body experience, things won't look exactly like they do in physical reality. Um, it's almost like I'm seeing them in terms of their auras or some kind of energy frequency. Um, the most common seems to be associated with, with the age and the accumulated emotional energy at that particular location. So very old buildings especially um, uh, will have a very strong energy signature that it's almost like they're they're glowing with a particular um, some kind of emotional information it's almost like you can get a sense of what the nature of that that building might be I mean this this might be along the lines of what people who when psychics go into a building and they pick up particular information about a location and who might have lived there something happened there you know that kind of thing it's almost like that but seeing this in a, in a very visual sense when you're in the out body experience so um, a, a, a tree for example will have a very particular kind of energy about it more uh, in my experience more crystalline more yellowish white uh, those kinds of high more like a high frequency like it's because like it's alive essentially um, whereas I can think uh, one example there was a, there was an old hospital that was very near to where I grew up um, I think it was Victorian um, and I remember in one experience I moved over that old hospital and the, and the whole building seemed to have these much more earthy colors uh, sort of reds and um, it seemed much more that there was a there was a mixture of, of things there like suffering but also this sense of uh, uh, health and well-being and giving as well so that was a very interesting building because of that because it had this I suppose like any hospital uh, has this combination of birth, death, all these different factors uh, that, that people experience within within the walls of that kind of place so yeah, yeah. And then you might not necessarily think of that um, no. on, a, on a day-to-day level, but when you're in this altered state of the out-of-body experience and you go near to something like that, you suddenly realize, of course, that makes total sense, but it's uh, that a building might, might, if these levels exist, then they, they would give off this, this information or these patterns to us. When, when, what, did you ever go over a jail or a prison in contrast, we'll say, to the hospital or... A church or something. When I heard that, I was thinking of all the different types of buildings that you might go over. Again, prisons, you know, some of them are very old, same thing, so you'd have the age there, but obviously, I don't know, a completely different energy, right? I've experienced um, a similar energy with a prison, but not not in the out of body state, just in a. Um, I once visited a very old Victorian prison in in London where I grew up um, and and there I had very interesting contrasting um, energies just like I felt in myself it was a very um, instinctual uh, thing the way I experienced that 
but I have experienced churches in the outer body state um, mm -hmm. and, and other temples, not just uh, um, Christian churches, but also in India as well and places like that. Um, and, and they have again this um, more crystalline uh, energy, more uh, yellowish white. I would I would say um, more along the lines with uh, with nature somehow, which is interesting as well. Um, I wouldn't necessarily associate the two in my mind, but uh, in the outer body experiences, they often have that kind of feeling about them, but maybe more more expansive quite hard to dis describe really in sure language, but, um, well, I think I think that I think it's a it's a interesting thing for people to think about and recognize you know this idea that we're everything's giving off some form of energy we understand the life forms you know plants and animals and people but but when even people I mean even uh, buildings and stuff like that you know also have their own energy frequency to them um, you talked about a tree uh, and I and I know you talked about it in your books and 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 with other people. Tell us about this interconnecting with a tree. What is that like? So, all right, l let me get an understanding of what this is first. So you you leave your body, your your this this extended consciousness of yourself, right? And you come across a tree. And are you able to? I know you use the word interconnect. So, are you able? Are you going inside the tree, or are you just somehow merging energies with the tree? Um, and if so, what does that feel like? I know you're very visual, so I'll try to get you to get beyond. I like the visual, but we can maybe. What does it feel like? What is it? Is there a smell? Is there a taste? You know, what else is there that we can get from that tree? Tell me about that. Um, it well. If I give an example of, um, I, I can't remember exactly uh, experiencing it so much with a tree, but um, there, there's a, a, a very powerful experience I had with a flower, a small, small plant. Where I, um, well, how it felt was initially I was, I was, I was over the treetops, and that was just very much like, in terms of feeling, I had this sense of moving through the air. I had this sense of. Um, looking down over the trees, there was a sense of sunlight. It was a, a very vivid, um, intense sunlight, um, and and a sense of warmth on my on my body um, to some degree. So I did have this sense, almost like I was a body at that point in time. Mm. Um, and then I went down through through the treetops, and there was all this uh, energy which seemed to be blended with the daylight. I couldn't I couldn't really a hundred percent tell you whether it was sunlight. And energy, or whether it was just how I experienced sunlight in that in that state, it was. Uh, but it felt much more expansive and much more um, energetic than if I physically walked out into the sunlight. Um, so I went down, and I was in amongst all the all the trees, and then I I saw this this flower. But then it was like somehow my consciousness singled out. This, this flower and then it was like I zoomed in on it essentially so it was like my whole being became completely focused on on the details so that that was very much a visual thing initially but then as I looked at the details th this is very common in remote viewing and in our body experiences actually but when you look at something often you might zoom right into it it's almost like um, in a physical sense, you just look, and unless you physically move, nothing will happen. But when you're operating in this state where it's almost like pure consciousness, you just can go right into the essence of something. Yeah. Um, so, looking at that particular flower, then I started to see the the, the detail in a much more vivid way than I, I could physically. And then it was like my being was being drawn into it. It was like not so much maybe I was interconnected with it but more like I was experiencing what it would be to be that to be that plant mm. so it was feeling the nutrients I remember this sense of um, uh, what's the word uh, this sense of feeling more vital and more alive because the the nutrients and the and the fluids were coming up through the stem 
which was which was like my body in this experience so it was like yeah. uh, and, then, and then this uh, awareness of being rooted to the soil as well and this uh, network of roots uh, underneath and um, and just this multi-cellular multi-awareness that uh, I, I think a lot of the experiences both with plants both on, on, on sort of other levels multi dimensional levels or whatever they are and also with with animals and other other forms of uh, mammalian life um, I've had this sense that they don't just operate as a singular individual and even I don't see humans like that anymore within these kinds of experiences it's, it's almost like there's a lattice of connections nodes points of information um, and, and when you connect to one, it's almost like you're connecting to all those other, other ones, and that's uh, mm. that's very much how how the experience with the flower was. But then, all of these other kinds of experiences, you get this breaking down of the the I, the individual, and this more expansiveness, which I think is what religions and near death experiences and, and people across the world are describing. In, in lots of different types of experience but I think the out of body experience is an amazing way of connecting with that because it's the most direct way in a way of, of uh, uh, moving away from body awareness and into that larger consciousness in, oh, incredible uh, yes I, I totally agree I, I people who have had near-death experiences you know like said the same thing like um, usually it was they were focusing on people but like Anita Morjani, um, who I had talked with, you know, she would foc she focused on her brother, and it was sort of the same thing. As soon as she did, like zoomed in on her brother, it was just like, you know, she knew exactly everything that he was feeling, what he was doing. You know, it was just zoomed in on him. You know, in a similar way that you did with the flower, um, and so. I mean, what a wonderful benefit to to the out of body experience to be able to do that what you described about that flower I can't imagine anybody listening that isn't fascinated you know it, it's mind-blowing and then it's like oh I want to have that experience you know I want to have that experience now I don't imagine you can have an experience like that and then it changes your relationship with flowers I, I would guess uh, you know I mean is it can you can you go and cut a flower now I mean <laughs> I don't know it, it makes you a lot more aware of our our role in nature for sure and and um, experiences like that did lead me to go vegan and to um, try to live in a more non-violent way where where I show compassion and connection with all of the life around me um, and and cause as little harm as possible I suppose so yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's very hard to not see those those things as a part of the whole process of how you live your life after an experience like that um, and you know the time flies by so fast so you also you also describe a similar thing with a mouse maybe a little more briefly we can you can just tell us about sort of doing the same thing with a with a was it was a mouse or a mole or some so, something a rodent of some description yeah. I mean I don't, I don't know exactly what it was but yeah I had this I had this, uh, that was almost like a recording of its entire life or experiencing its entire life. I felt, um, I started off, I was just meditating in, in the woods um, and I, I was looking out into the, it was dark at the time and I was looking out into the darkness and I started to pick up little points of light um, and then I started to realize that those points of light within the the undergrowth of the forest were actually consciousness. They were points of consciousness, small, small creatures within within the the undergrowth. And then I started to feel that I was one of them, and I was connected with them. Um, and then I I felt this sense of pure instinct. It wasn't like um, I was thinking with the same kind of consciousness anymore. It was like I was now experiencing the world around me. Um, it's so hard to describe. It's some almost like autopilot, but with with some sense of all of the other creatures as well. It was like I had telepathy, and I knew where they were, 
so it was like we were working as a group as a unit um, and then I went through this whole process of experiencing its life and um, going into its uh, burrow under the ground and all of the different elements that made up its its instinct for survival and its uh, awareness of its environment around its awareness of smell was very acute its awareness of uh, fear of daylight essentially because it was vulnerable in, in daylight that was very very strong in the experience um, and then ultimately its death uh, when it was uh, killed by a, an eagle or a, a bird of prey of some description so it was the whole life cycle essentially so now that now that's interesting because and I was actually a little confused by that before because so was this was this a live animal though that you were sort of focusing in on at that time or and yeah how would you experience the death was it a former death was it or was it not a live animal and it was an energy of I don't maybe you know maybe you don't know I don't know it's it's very hard to say um, all I can do is is describe how it felt and what yeah but um, I suppose it would have to be some some kind of uh, previous experience or um, but then that opens up all these questions and ideas in terms of does information about our lives continue on in, that can be transformed into a reincarnation or into um, the afterlife or you know so, so I suppose I see it as a, a creature maybe that had already lived but I was somehow connecting with with the essence of that, of yeah. that life. Um, but it's it's very hard to know completely definitely um, there was a lot more I wanted to ask you. I, you've traveled to other planets as well, as well, right? And I, I imagine that would take a long time to describe. Um, is it? Is it just must be an, an amazing experience to be able to do that? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think the most moving ones have probably been being in the upper atmosphere of the Earth and being near to the Earth and just looking down on the place that you originated and. And seeing the continents and the seas and the oceans and um, just getting this sense of all the life and and you know that that you're down there somewhere and that there's all these millions of other lives it's it's very very humbling I suppose seeing seeing something like that um, mm. Mm. in terms of further space uh, it's uh, I I haven't encountered anything like um, aliens or anything like that. Um, Sorry to disappoint some, <laughs> some of the people out there. Yeah, <laughs> but um, but I have uh, nevertheless uh, been completely or awe, awestruck by by just how huge the universe appears to be when I've explored and gone gone on these uh, experiences on these yeah. journeys. Um, but usually, um, it's it's been. A rare occurrence that I've been able to go to that kind of level and show sure. that part. Yeah, people talk about um, uh, being connected to your body by a silver cord or something. Is that sort of the idea? Uh, I haven't encountered the silver cord. I know some people do experience that. I'm I'm not sure what my what my view on that is, but it, it might just be as we were talking about earlier. This this. Uh, projection of that we identify with our body much more s strongly in the early stages mm. and maybe that that connection that that identification that we have is is shown through through a silver cord or something like that early yeah. on but I think uh, often often people don't, won't experience the silver cord and I haven't experienced it so. and, and at any time if you wanted to go back to your body you just uh, you can do that yeah, sure. I mean, the difficult part is usually trying to stay away for longer. Um, with the average experience being about 20 minutes, I'd say my, most people are trying to um, keep away from their body because it's, they want to do more, they want to see more, they want to go further. But, but I think in a way your, your default um, awareness is in your body. Yeah. So it's harder to to keep away from the body in the same sense as leaving the body is, requires 
um, learning and a process. I think also staying away from the body for an extended period of time needs needs a bit of practice. And, is there an awareness of time when you're there, or does you know does twenty minutes feel like three hours? Or it can do, yeah, very much so. Uh, twenty minutes rarely feels like twenty minutes because I suppose you're very excited and exhilarated and um, things that can seem very mundane um, in in physical reality can be completely fascinating when you're in the out of body experience. So. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. Uh, all right, so with the little time we have left, and uh, let's talk about how this relates to the afterlife. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, well, let me just ask you a, a very general question. You know, what, what do out-of-body experiences teach us about the afterlife? And you can go any direction you want with that. Okay. Um, I, think, I think they give us the opportunity to explore that level directly. Really, I, I, that's that's what I would that's what I would say. I think that um, not commonly, but often within my experiences, I will reach areas that seem to be what we would describe as the afterlife. Um, for example, the summer lands that are often described in in different traditions. These this uh, place that seems like earth-like, but is also saturated with sunlight and nature and natural type environment um, and populated by by people who seem to have passed on so uh, that that will probably probably be the one that is often experienced in in other people's uh, uh, descriptions and also in my own so that would be one one key level and I think by going to that sort of level again it can it can reconfirm to you that that there is more to our consciousness than just the end of when when we when we physically die, um, and I, I think uh, some of my experiences as well have given me some confirmation that that these levels that I've reached are also objective in, to some degree, like um, one that happened with a plane crash where I saw. A large group of people who seemed confused, as if they just just died, um, and they were all in a in a large group, and they were all at a distance, and there was this yeah very acute sense of confusion and, and not knowing what had happened to them, what was going on, and then when the experience ended and I returned to my body, um, not long afterwards, I I heard that there'd been this large plane crash and that a large group of people had, had died in in this plane crash and although I can't confirm it a hundred percent it did seem very likely that what I'd seen was related was the people who, who died in the plane crash. Yeah, could you tell if they were aware of each other? Um... They, they did seem to be aware of each other they didn't seem to be aware of me or or maybe I was just too at a distance or uh, it's hard to say, but mm. um, I didn't notice them being aware of me. But yeah. but they seem to be aware of each other. Definitely. What do they look like to you? Um, I, because I was at a distance, they I, I couldn't see very much detail. But they just they were like figures. They they uh, I had sense. I think of uh, I'd have to check my diary to be totally sure of all the details. But I think they I think they seemed just like. They didn't have any injuries. I didn't notice anything that would maybe give give away that they'd just been in an accident or anything like that. Yeah. But emotionally, they were giving off this confusion. Yeah. Uh, they just seemed like normal people, like a, a group of mixed normal people, but a very large group to all be in the same kind of emotional state. Yeah. And not be in that one location. And it felt it felt very much like the first level, if you like. It felt like the the point at which you would get to right after having gone through um, yeah. death experience. Um, yeah, and we again a lot of near death experience people have experience have talked about that. You know that first whoa. You know where am I? And that's often when they see their body uh, and and go oh <laughs> oh. Um, can you do this by intention? So for instance, if 
you talked about the summer lands. Some might people people might call it the af- the afterlife or you know the spirit world or a level of that. Mm-hmm. Um, other people have written about the summer lands as you talk about uh, as you mentioned. Um, can you let's just say maybe not obviously not at, at my level, but at your level where you are able to go in and out of the the out of body experience. Could you set the intention to go to the summer lands and, and actually have that experience, you think? Um, for me personally, I, I found it quite difficult to get to those kinds of levels, but I think probably people like mediums or people who are more working with that kind of level mm-hmm. um, on a day-to-day level, I think probably they might they might find it easier to get to that level or or maybe we're just dealing with something because it is really intended for people who have disconnected completely from the physical level yeah because it maybe requires that yeah um, maybe it, it, it is just more difficult to reach in that in that way um, when I have attempted to get to that kind of level it's required almost like a purification of myself, mm. uh, um, so some degree of fasting or or, or uh, really focusing what, on what I'm trying to do, and then I've been able to reach back to that kind of level to some degree. Mm. But it's it's had mixed mixed success in my experience. But but I don't know of many people who've really experimented and tried to do that. Um, so it's another area that I want to explore more and to see if it is possible. To reach to that level in, in this way more, um, so these are all these are all exciting areas really that, that are still there to be explored. They really are, and and it excites me as well. I, I think that uh, you talk a little bit about uh, how people could use the OBE as a way to communicate with deceased loved ones. Uh, you even give you know like I don't know is it five steps or something? You know, some instruction as to how how they it, that might help them do that, accomplish that. That's the purification process I was talking about. Okay, uh, which is so interesting because I, I years ago when I first started researching this field, I uh, I ran into a woman who was a medium who <laughs> she was she was a riot. She was funny, uh, but she said that uh, she she seemed to believe that by eating bacon it helped her to have the out of body experience. <laughs> so I always wondered about that. And then you're talking about purification. I'm not sure how bacon you know fits into that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, what kind of success have you seen with maybe even students of yours, clients, students of yours who uh, who have wanted to communicate or meet with? This isn't just communicate, right? This is really meet with deceased loved ones. Potentially um, meet them, yeah. I, I think what, what tends to happen from people I've worked with is they describe almost like a symbolic um, connection. It's almost like the the loved one sends them a message in some way that um, can be in terms of where they go within the out of body experience um, so it's almost like they'll they'll be drawn to a location that maybe they've never actually been to but it could it, but it might relate to something very important in the life of the of the loved one um, and then it and then the next day they might not necessarily connect things but then they'll 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 suddenly have this moment where they'll realise. Um, for example, even in my own experience, uh, my my mother's closest friend uh, was a woman who was born in Cuba. Um, she was of Jamaican descent, but born in Cuba. Um, and I I knew her all my life. She she looked after me as a child, um, and I was very sad when she, when she died. And and I. I noted it down in my spiritual diary on the day that she died um, and wrote uh, a bit about her. And then I, I didn't have any out-of-body experiences for maybe a couple of weeks. Um, and then I had this out-of-body experience where I found myself moving over Cuba and, uh, and Jamaica. Um, and it was a very be- beautiful experience, very vivid, had the sense of the oceans, the feeling of the sun, the feeling of the of moving over over the different areas and the small fisheries and all the different uh, people um, along the coast. And then when I returned to my body, I didn't actually think at the time that this 
had anything to do with her. It didn't. It, I didn't make the connection in my head. But then when I opened my diary, I saw that the last thing I'd written in my diary was that she died. And then suddenly, I realised that this was uh, directly related in some way through this. She, it was like I'd gone to her birthplace essentially. Yeah. She'd drawn me there, and suddenly I I felt this intense presence or feeling of, of her um, as a result of that. So. That that's that's similar to the kinds of things people describe, and also sometimes um, visitations as well. This uh, they'll see a figure, um, they'll see their loved one as a as a figure um, close by. You know, so it's almost like they'll visit them. Um, so that that can be quite common. But by going through that process of focusing on their loved one and being engaged with them, it's almost like they're sending that request out. And sometimes it will happen in a symbolic way of going out of body and sometimes it will happen where that loved one will actually visit them in some way. So, mm. Mm. New frontiers, no question about it. Huh? I mean, just new things that, that, that I'm sure you're going to be looking into. I can't wait to hear, you know, I can't, in a year, I can't wait to hear how things have changed, you know, um, for you and, and what you've learned. Uh, as a final, as a final message, I know this is really hard for anybody to do, but um, you know what have you what have you learned or gained spiritually? Uh, you know the big message from from doing this work that you've done that maybe we can inspire others to do to to do it too. I think the big message for me has just been to maybe to to, to let go of my assumptions and let go of uh, my. My, my preoccupations with, with the way I am let go of my focus on myself in a way and just um, explore and, and see what's out there and find that that sense of interconnection and that wider consciousness and we ha I think we have so much potential in terms of our consciousness still to tap and I think the out of body experience is, is for me has been a completely amazing transformative way of reaching that and and just learning, seeing every day as a learning process, really. Yeah. How often do you have an out-of-body experience? Um, I tend to I tend to have maybe two a month at the moment. Three. Uh, wow. Well, Jeez, sort of that's a lot. You you've had a lot. I mean, I, just so the audience knows, I mean, it'll be in the paragraph underneath this video. But you've been doing this for twenty five years, right? Yeah, since the first ones when I was 12, counting now. Yeah, and what are you, 36, 37 now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's a long time. Fascinating story. Obviously, uh, I tried to cover some different stuff that people wouldn't hear in some of the other interviews. Uh, things that, I, you know, excited me that I wanted to ask you. Boy, I just wish I had a whole weekend. I could just fire questions off at you and hear about your experiences. This is a great book uh, for people to, to, to read and learn about these experiences, but not just read and learn about them, learn how they can, can, can have these experiences themselves. There's a whole section, it's like a third of the book that you give different ideas of how uh, people can induce autobiography experiences for themselves, which is... Oh, well, just, that's what I want them to do. I want people to really be able to do this for themselves and to transform their lives, I suppose, in the same way it's been for me. You know? it, it's so cool. You also have another book, Navigating the Out-of-Body Experience, that is more about your story, just more of a uh, storyline with some conclusions at the end that Avenues I kept hearing the about. Spirit, that one. What's that? Avenues of the Human Spirit. Avenues one. of the Human Spirit. Oh, I, I, just read the, I just read this title. <laughs> That's good. I'm glad I wrote that title down. Um, but yeah, Avenues of the Human Spirit. And I've, I've heard a lot of great things about that book as well. And, uh, but completely different. You know, more about your story so that people can understand, oh man, if this guy can do it, I can do it. You know, I mean, you just come from very, whatever, ordinary uh, uh, beginnings. Uh, you, you struggled. You had a lot of struggles in your life. It's not like, you know, any of this has come easy. But it's just fascinating that a 12-year-old would want to, would have an experience and, and then want to repeat that experience and then spend 25 or more years, you know, 
just having it over and over and over again. Great story. I recommend it to everybody. Uh, the links are down below. Uh, GrahamNichols.com. Nichols has two L's uh, at the end. But, and they can just click on that and go to your website. Other interviews there, and they can just learn more about you. I, I can't thank you enough. I, what a great way to start off season two. I'm excited. I hope we can have you back because I do feel like we could have you back once a month and, and we wouldn't <laughs> cover all this stuff. <laughs> but anyways, thank you, Graham, so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, bye.